thanks, John. Thanks, you guys. Hope you're enjoying ISOCAMP. Um, I can add to my history a little bit. I was an undergraduate here. I was born in Moab, which is about three hours south of here. You guys all go there to have fun. In the 60s, it wasn't that much fun. It was a uranium mining town when I was there. Uh, my mom was a beautician. My dad shot coyotes for the Bureau of Land Management and was a member of the Mongols motorcycle gang. <laughs> Uh, he left when I was four, uh, went to high school. Nobody in my high school went to college. Neither of my parents graduated from high school. And uh, you sort of had these choices of go work in mining, join the military, go to prison, you know. <laughs> um, I picked the military and was ready to join the Navy. And uh, during that time, I'd sort of been working in theater in Denver and Salt Lake in the very influential person in my life was my high school drama teacher, said you should apply for a scholarship at the University of Utah. And I came here and got a Bachelor of Fine Arts, I moved to New York City, worked at Swartz Theater for three or four years, not two years. Came back, ridiculous for the time, I think I borrowed $800 to pay for a quarter at the University of Utah to take courses I was interested in, which seems silly today. Um, and I took a bunch of courses, but the most important one is I took plant ecology from Jim Elringer. And Jim was, and this guy Darren Sanquist, who'll be here next week, was the TA, who was very influential on me. I became a Elringer groupie, you know, hanging out in the lab as an undergrad, and finally this guy named Craig Cook or something gave me a job. Says I was the worst technician ever in the history of the Elringer lab. <laughs> um, and then I, as Jim will do, he calls you into his office and says, it's about time for you to go to graduate school. And you go, duh, what's graduate school? And then he gets you into graduate school and you go. And, then he got me a postdoc, and the rest is history, and I've been at Cornell for 17 years, so a long time. Today we're going to focus on nitrogen isotopes. There's only an hour and a half, really. For, everyone hates nitrogen isotopes, so <laughs> carbon and oxygen, it's not, nice, it's, it's not our fault, it's the isotope's fault, because they kind of behave badly like me, and so we have a good relationship, and I do a lot of work with nitrogen isotopes. Um, what I'd sort of like to do today is give you a pretty good uh, lead in so you can conceptualize the terrestrial nitri nitrogen cycle. I'm going to dabble in marine and freshwater sources, but primarily the terrestrial cycle, and then understand how this affects isotope ratio. And then move on to follow up with what Jim did, talking about stir, source, trace, integrate, record, with some examples of how we use nitrogen isotopes in all of those regards. It used to be that I was the only person in all of ISOCAMP that would have like people come up to the board and have group activities. And apparently I'm a virus because it's spread through everyone now. So we will do some of that. And then a new thing I've decided to do this year is play isotopology, which is once you are an isotope person, which you will be when you get out of here, in any given week, you get five to six figures sent by people who you're on samples for, and they say, what does this mean? <laughs> and so for the last week, I collected everyone that I got. And I haven't even decided what they mean, but we're going to decide together. And about every 15 minutes, I will try to do that. And hopefully it'll be fun. Before I go into everything, I wanted to kind of give you some, this really simple statement, because I'm the kind of person, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of a, I'm not a very bright person. Um, so when I was your age, this was me. <laughs> I'm that one. <laughs> Um, so you can tell, you know, really bad choices in hairstyle and friends and <laughs> beverages, <laughs> stealing signs, all that kind of stuff. So I always liked when people would tell me really simple things before you got all caught up in all the details. So when I'm talking to somebody about isotopes, I almost always tell them to start, if you want to be an isopope or a sorcerer, to ask, train yourself to ask yourself these three questions. If someone puts something in your hand and says, What's the isotope ratio of this? Say, well, what are the sources that could have potentially gone into this compound, whatever it is? What fractionation events might have happened going into it? And then finally, the source pool, this is the hard one, that's feeding into that, was it open, closed, or somewhere in between? So you've come to this many times with Rayleigh distillation or with the photosynth photosynthesis equations, that how open that pool is is allowing the kinetic fractionation to express itself. And across everything we do in isotopes, 
Sometimes that's very true, sometimes that's not true at all, and sometimes it's kind of in between true. So understanding whether it's photosynthesis, which is drawing from this big pool of CO2 in the atmosphere, and then being constrained a little bit by stomata and diffusion resistances versus nitrogen uptake into a plant where the influx is so small that the enzymes can't fractionate. They're perfectly happy to, just like Rubisco, and they will do an isolation, but you never see it because that pool's entirely consumed, okay? So always keep those three things in mind. So nitrogen. As opposed to most of the other isotopes that we think about or biogeochemical cycles that we think about, nitrogen is less about where it is and more about what it is. So it's very much based in chemical transformations. So when we think about carbon, we're thinking about, okay, the carbon in the soil, the carbon in the atmosphere, where is it? Where is it in space? With nitrogen, it's usually what chemical form is it in? Is as equally as important and sometimes more important. So where is most of the nitrogen on Earth? The atmosphere, right? So it's in this molecule, it's very abundant, it's 78% of, well, of this room, but we're all respiring, so maybe we're driving it out a little bit. But most of it's in the atmosphere. So the initial interest in nitrogen cycling in general is how is this being converted into other forms that have other functions? So it's really a game of how do we oxidize or reduce this N2 into something that then participates in biology or some other kind of chemistry. Because N2 itself isn't very reactive, okay? So we're changing oxidation states. So there's N2 right here. We're either moving in an oxidating direction and back or moving in a re reduction or fixation direction. So the whole terrestrial and any nitrogen cycle really is based on understanding how we move around these different nitrogen compounds, okay? And the reason that it's been so of interest to ecologists forever is the interconversion of this between what we call inorganic molecules, which is everything over here on this side, and our organic molecules is the important thing that drives productivity in li living systems. And let's explore that a little bit. So this is a picture of a tropical tree in Panama. I was in a canopy crane, took a picture of it. So for this organism, what kind of nitrogen does it need to survive and grow? Organic. Primarily inorganic, so nitrate, ammonium. Over the past couple of decades, we've learned that plants will directly take up some forms of organic nitrogen, but it's primarily nitrate and ammonium and those forms, those inorganic forms. Okay, and they're the autotrophic groups of organisms that require this. What about this guy? So d how well does this tiger survive on nitrate and ammonium? Not very well, right? <laughs> so this is an organism that very much wants to consume molecules that are very similar to its own body, okay? So when you're at the zoo and you're sitting there and you're staring at this tiger, and it's staring back at you and you're having this nirvanic experience, remember, you are basically a bunch of proteins that it wants to get into its stomach because you're very similar to, to what it is. So the interconversion between these two things is what ultimately drives productivity in ecosystems from a nitrogen perspective. So we have a bunch of organic stuff that has to go back to being inorganic stuff so the autotrophs can use it, and then the autotrophs produce and start the organic molecules to drive everybody else. Just like Jim said, nothing but plants and microbes matter because they're the ones accumulating all the energy. So everything's just else is ancillarily put on. And then once we have all the dead stuff, we gotta turn it back into inorganic so the autotrophics, autotrophs can use it again. And that's really the motivation and the basis for the terrestrial nitrogen cycle. So the way I like to go through it, which attempts to remove some of the things that really confuse people, I mean, let's face it, the nitrogen cycle, the carbon cycle, the phosphorus cycle, the sulfur cycle, you guys have had that in some course at some time, and it was the boringest thing you ever saw. And someone threw up five PowerPoint slides and said, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> and you memorize some stuff and you put it on exam, but you never really conceptualized it very well. So the things I'm gonna try and do is talk about the chemical transformations, because those are what's key to understanding the cycle 
And keep in mind that the interconversion of organic to inorganic is the primary interest here. There's other interests, but that's why ecologists and other biologists started to really focus in on the nitrogen cycle. And then the third thing I'm going to do is I'm going to try and separate internal cycling from additions and losses. That's a thing that is very confusing to people because if you look at the average tree growing in the mountains here in the Wasatch Front, almost all of its growth nitrogen is coming from internal cycling. It's from the biomass that's being produced in that system, it's being, it's being converted into inorganic, which the plants are then taking up and it continues that cycle. And then there's a whole other set of things that add and lose exogenous nitrogen to the system. Okay, so I'm going to deal with those separately so you can keep them straight in your head. All right, PowerPoint sucks, so we're actually going to write some notes. You guys remember what notes were, right? You remember that stuff? All right. I like to do things on notes. Oh, I used to like to do things on notes. I'm now getting so blind and refuse to get bifocals that I can't hold this far enough away. But we'll give it a try anyway. So I'm going to go through the nitrogen cycle, and I want you to write it down. I'm going to torture the camera person because I'll keep moving over here. So what we're going to start with is a tree with roots. Okay, and everything that tree produces, the leaves, the branches, eventually the bowl, all the fine roots, everything, is all falling onto the soil surface. Everything's moving in. We'll put an animal in here, a suicidal monkey. Ah! So everything that's organic <laughs> is dying. Okay, and when it dies, it all becomes part of the soil organic matter pool. Okay, so this is all the organic material that is going into the soil system. Some of it, don't get too caught up on this, but some of it may be kind of recalcitrant. But most of it's labile. It can move around. By the way, when I was 13, I broke my back and I have this interesting nerve thing going on. So if I'm drawing along and it goes, ah, don't be alarmed. <laughs> I usually recover from it if I think about it long enough. Okay, all of this stuff is acted on by a giant suite of organisms from bacteria and fungi all the way up to, I would argue, hippopotamus that participate in mineralization, which is basically breaking all this stuff down, all that material. And this process takes all of this stuff and turns it into ammonium, which is NH4+. Okay. And this process, I just said it, but it's called mineralization. And luckily for us, or unluckily, there's not a lot of fractionation that occurs at this step. If you scour the literature, you get a range of values between about a negative one and, and one per mil. Mineralization. Okay. This ammonium pool can do a couple of different things. One of the big things it do, does is it's, inter, it's converted to nitrate. Okay. There's actually a few chemical steps in here, but we're just going to talk about ammonium to nitrate, and this process is called nitrification. This is done by a particular kind of bacteria, the nitrifying bacteria, and they do this process to gain energy. So they're, they're chemotrophs, so they actually can derive energy from this transformation. And if you scour the literature, you're going to start to love these numbers in nitrogen isotopes. It's somewhere between a 12 and 35 per mil fractionation. Okay? So that means that what's being produced is lighter and what's left behind is heavier. So why do we have these big giant ranges? We're going to get into that, but there's been a very limited ability to go in and ask a microbe, microbial species, exactly how much it fractionates. So most things have been more macro, dealing with the whole community where you have a mix of species, 
potentially doing different things. And the supply, and the supply dynamics are usually different. Some are dealing with a big pool of nitrogen fully expressing fractionation. Some are dealing with a small pool, so they're falling out along that Rayleigh distillation at different points, and you're getting these different numbers. Um, the one thing I do have to do every year when I do, yeah? Sorry, just to, just to clarify, when you say it's 12 to 35 per mil, that means the nitrate produced is 12 to 35 per mil lower or heavier? Lower, depleted. Lower, okay. What is the mineralization? It's about one, negative one to one. It's usually not detectable. So, you know, you can sort of assume zero usually for mineralization. The light thing coming from this reaction is not only just nitrate in the soil, which is in the soil solution, there are also gases produced. Okay, so these two, these two gases are NO and NO2. Where are my... And they're leaving the system. And they're very light as well. Okay, so they're on the depleted side of that fractionation. Question? It's N2, oh sorry, I said NO2 the first time. There is, there is no NO2, NO2 is formed later in the atmosphere, but NO is produced, my mistake. This nitrate is utilized by another group of organisms, the organisms, the denitrifying bacteria, and that process is called denitrification. And this is my favorite, favorite one. Zero to 33 per mil. Although if you look in the literature, those zero numbers are about 20 years old now, and we're starting not to believe them. So I, that is very much sort of coming up. And sort of an average value is about 26 per mil. Okay. This process produces gases as well. <clears throat> Primarily nitrous oxide and then back to the diatomic N2. Okay? And they are very light. The nitrate and ammonium don't necessarily have to go through this pathway. Either one of them and both of them get taken up by plants. and microbes, okay? Depending upon the literature, this is either called assimilation this is what plant people like to call it, and then there's immobilization. which is what the microbial people want, like to call it. And it's, each of these processes, the reported range is about a negative one to about 1.6 per mil. Okay? One other thing we need to put on here, and it doesn't always happen, but we talked about mineralization not being very fractionating. There's sort of one exception to that, and that's that this ammonium pool depending upon the pH of the system, can produce ammonia. This is really important in deserts, where things are, and I work in deserts, so it matters a lot to us. So at very basic pHs, the pKa drives ammonia production. And this is highly fractionating, and it's about 20 to 27 per mil. Okay. All right, that's all I want to add for now. So you're now, that's it. I don't need to lecture anymore. You know everything about the terrestrial nitrogen cycle. All right? No, there's a couple of rules you can take out of here that aren't as crazy as you think. One thing that you notice is all of these processes are, are enriching the substrate that's left behind. So what that means is because you see nitrification enriches the left behind pool, denitrification, enriches the left behind pool. That means that soil processing tends to enrich 
the remaining soil substrate, which is, is useful. The other thing, rule you can use, is that even though you may have a lot of variation in these different steps, the isotope ratio is a good indicator of change. So say you have a treatment, and you know there's a place that's been clear cut, there's a place that's been burned, it's had some kind of perturbation. By tracking the overall integration of N15 in that system, you can track a, track a change. The challenges are going to be in attributing that change to some change in process, but just knowing the change is really, really useful. Okay, so what do I mean by that? You could have a plant growing somewhere, and one place is a fertilization plot, one, one is not. And you could track their foliar N15 values through that and look at the changes. And you know something is changing in the soil nitrogen processing. You may not be able to attribute it to anything. And if in your mind you're going, whoa, this really sucks, why would anybody ever want to do that? The alternative to quantifying all those processes is extremely, extremely painful. So if you have an ecosystem level project and you want to look at process changes, quantifying all of these things takes a really, really long time. And so having a very nice way of just saying, oh, there's change, and it's enriching, or the isotope ratio is changing in this direction, that direction, will narrow down the processes that you need to look at with other methods to figure out what's happening in that system. And that's been enormously huge in um, nitrogen isotope ratio. 